And welcome to the European Parliament in Brussels for Talking Europe on France 24. The EU's common agricultural policy began operating in 1962 to achieve food security on the continent. Well, 50 years later, because the cap, as it's known, swallows almost 40% of the EU budget, this policy is proving increasingly controversial. That's why the EU has launched a comprehensive reform of its flagship programme in a bid to make it greener and more efficient. Jan Heutema, welcome to Talking you. Europe. Uh, you're a Dutch MEP from the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats. On top of being a politician, you run a dairy farm in the north of Holland, in, uh, in Friesland, in Friesland, actually, yes. I believe. Uh, so you're w one of Europe's uh, 12 million farmers. Also with us, Peter Eriksson, you are from Sweden. You're a Swedish MEP from the group of the Greens. You live in the north of Sweden, in in Lapland. Yeah, very north, far north, in, in the forest, in a small, small farm, but I'm, I'm not a farmer, I couldn't say. That. Not yet. Well, <laughs> I have been a bit, but, but not today. <laughs> well, my first question, why does Europe need a common agricultural policy? Because it's one of the few policies that are entirely run at EU level. Why does Europe need an ambitious cap? Um, I think there are some challenges ahead of us. We have to look into the future. And one is uh, feeding the world. Uh, the United Nations uh, does predict that uh, the food demand will increase by 70% in 2050, so almost doubling. Um, the problem is that resources to produce all the food become scarcer, and also uh, the area of farmland will not grow that much, only maybe with 4%. So we need a more innovative agriculture that's more predict pr productive and more efficient. Uh, from the point of view of the Greens, do you support the uh, common agricultural policy? I think we need a, a, a cap. Uh, we, we see that um, uh, food security is uh, extremely important. We can, we can compare with energy security when we see that when other countries can uh, uh, imp impede a certain power on Europe because the, we are very vulnerable and we have to import both gas and oil. Now, it's, if we're not able to, to produce the food ourselves, somebody else can take this power and, and, and um, uh, leave us in, in a very bad situation. And, and, and there, there are also the other thing that if, if we, uh, maybe we could buy the food from elsewhere and then we leave other people starving uh, in, in other parts of the world. So it's, world. A, it's a matter of so sovereignty it, as well, yeah, you're telling sovereignty us? Sovereignty and solidarity as well, I should say. And we want quality food in, in Europe and, and it's uh, not possible to, to buy these quality food on the uh, world market always. Now, as I said, the European Union has vowed to make the common agricultural policy greener and more efficient. Let's watch our story brought to us by Delano de Souza. At 52 billion euros annually, Europe's common agricultural policy still represents a large chunk of the EU's budget. The latest changes are meant to ensure a more balanced cap. Direct payments per hectare will now be based on a national average. Small farms will get priority funding, and in an attempt to get more people into the profession, younger farmers will receive 25% more in aid for the first five years. The cap has also gotten a whole lot greener. It's promoting diversified crops, permanent grassland, and ensures farms have at least 5% of ecological-focused areas. Member states are allowed to decide how to roll out the new policy within their respective countries. But France, the biggest beneficiary, has already received bad news. The country will have to reimburse the European Union 1 billion euros over the next two years because it misspent funds. By far the largest penalty, considering the total amount of subsidies that needs to be paid back across Europe, stands at 1.5 billion. Uh, Jan Hoytema, you know what critics say the problem with the cap so far is that it has largely benefited uh, big scale uh, producers, cereal farmers, uh, and not so much small scale farmers. Mm -hmm. Will the reform change anything? I don't believe so. I think still this uh, cap reform is not very much market oriented. It's not stimulating innovation. 
um, like was mentioned in, in, in the movie here, is that per hectares of farmland, you receive a fixed amount of subsidies. People that own uh, farmland will receive the subsidies. So people will speculate with farmland as well. Um, farmland prices will increase, also the lease prices for farmland will increase. So um, the active farmer that is leasing or have to buy farmland will have to pay a higher price for that farmland. Is there something you're seeing in the Netherlands, speculation? On, on, on the farmland? Absolutely. At this moment already for leasing, so farmers that have to lease uh, farmland, yes, they have to pay more because per hectares of land there is a an, yeah, an, an form of subsidies. So the real active farmers will not receive the, the, the subsidy that is meant to be, but the owners of land. And I think that's a bad situation. Do you agree that there's yeah, I, some I agree that very much. We, and we promote uh, the, uh, a big change here and, and, and a cap on the payments for up to 100,000 euro. And that could make a big shift because then the big farmers won't get so much as today. And, and, and also the cost of land will go down. We are very disappointed that we lost that with a few votes in, in, in the parliament and, and um, that could make a big shift. And who's responsible for the situation? Was there a great deal of lobbying on behalf of the big guys in the industry? We should not forget that it's very difficult to have an ideal cap. Um, and in, in, in history we had a coupled support. So per kilograms of milk per kilogram of meat, you got a subsidy. Uh, they want to decouple it because it's yeah, intervening the market as well. Hey, you're a subsidy to produce more. Um, they want to decouple it and to find a different system to still support farmers. And they did it now per hectares of land, but also this system is malfunctioning. That's but it's now too, too much on big farmers and too much on conventional farmers, I think. Mm -hmm. And also too less uh, uh, for the young farmers, because we, we, we need a shift. We mm -hmm. need a new generation to come into to the farming in, in, in Europe. We would like to see uh, uh, investments going to young farmers and help to, to, to start up uh, the, the farmers for, for the, the people going into the business. And you believe it's not a case of this? So if I'm, uh, let's say, a young Greek unemployed or I'm from Sweden, I, I want to set up uh, a business, I want to uh, open a farm, Europe does not help me? Europe is not there to help me? The extremely big prices on land is, is uh, the, the, maybe the biggest problem because you need millions and millions, uh, at least in, in, in Swedish crowns, and uh, extremely a lot of money in Europe also. If you uh, could take not only investment in land, you should invest in, in uh, machines and buildings, and, and that's... Uh, oh, oh, impossible if you don't air it, the, the, most of this. Absolutely. We're talking about major challenges in the agriculture sector, that they have to produce more with less, that the environmental impact has to go down. But the big and the most uh, striving challenge is for young farmers to take over their farm. That's a very big problem. And if you don't have farmers, of course, you don't have that other problems anymore. No, we really have to focus on young farmers. And like uh, my colleague is saying quite, uh, quite well, that you need farmland and the prices are so high that it's almost impossible for young farmers to take over the business. As we heard in our first report, France is by far the biggest beneficiary of the, of, of the common agricultural policy. Now, the French are very much attached to the, the cap and they believe it works. They believe also that thanks to the cap, France has preserved a very diverse uh, agricultural sector. Mm. Uh, I remember uh, visiting the Dordogne region where, where, I, where I was told that if it weren't for the cap, we probably would have lost all this diversity and, and the richness of Europe. Is it true? Uh, partly it's true, I, I would say, but uh, uh, we have a uh, big problem still and I, I feel and the Greens feels that we should go to, to shift for more org organic production. We see that uh, people in, in Europe want more healthy and, and the tasty. And greening of, 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 of uh, the it's not, uh, No, no? It, it, it's a failure, I should say. In, in most of it, it has not gone uh, far enough at all. Uh, we see that uh, uh, consumers want much more organic food and, and the cap is not helping to, to make that shift. No, as I said, you, uh, you live in Lapland, that's yeah. not far from the Finnish border. As you know, Finland uh, is suffering at the moment as a result of the uh, Russian embargo on uh, European produce. Our reporter Alex Le Bourdon travelled to Finland and she spoke to some farmers there. Let's watch her report. Hop, hop. 
It's the start of the workday at this dairy farm in southern Finland. Hannala still spends as much time and attention on her 30 cows, but the farm's production is no longer profitable. Last summer, Russia closed its borders to European food products. That's caused a substantial drop in milk prices from 45 cents a liter to less than 35 cents. Before, the price of our dairy income was around 10,000 euros per month. Today, it's between 6 and 7,000 euros. Yep. Mm. Yet Hannala feels fortunate. In addition to her dairy herd, the farm has 300 hectares of grain fields. Without this income, she could not pay the wages at the end of the month. And then, what saved us too is that we have no debts. We haven't invested large sums recently on our operations. Other dairy farmers like Tapio aren't so lucky. In recent months, he expanded the size of his barn. He's gone from 60 cows to 80. He wanted to be ready for a major change in EU policy that went into effect on April 1st. We knew that these milk quotas were going to be removed, so we tried to revamp the farm to increase our capacity. We thought that would make up for lower milk prices that would inevitably result from the removal of these quotas. The problem was that we couldn't anticipate this trade war. The embargo has destabilized the entire industry. One-fifth of Valio's production was exported to Russia. Now the milk that was destined for its neighbor is being turned into powder or butter, less profitable products that weigh on the margins of the dairy cooperative. The management will have to lay off 320 of its employees. Yeah. If we continued in the same vein, we could have increased our market share in Russia. Now we have no certainty about the lifting of the embargo. So we have to look out for other markets. Since the start of the embargo, dairy producers have received 35 million euros of funding aid from the Finnish government and the European Union. But it's not enough for the industry to stay afloat. Last December, the European Union helped dairy farmers to the tune of 10.7 million euro. But it covered only the equivalent of one month's loss. Already hurt by the embargo, Finnish farmers are now waiting with concern to see what effect the removal of milk quotas will have on their businesses. My biggest fear is that the milk production in the EU is going to increase in an uncontrolled way and the price for the milk is going to stay low in a long, long run. A particularly difficult prospect in Finland where dairy production costs are very high. Jan Hauter, I remind our viewers that you're a Dutch MEP from the Liberals and Democrats and you also run a dairy farm in the Netherlands. We see the situation in Finland, two challenges there. First, of course, the Russian embargo mm -hmm. and also the removal of milk quotas. Mm -hmm. Why did the EU decide to remove these quotas? Well, it's quite easy actually because the last seven years we produce on the world market and the price is fixed uh, on the world market, so we pay the price that the world is giving us. It's uh, really a question of uh, production and demand. Um, and back in the days when we introduced the quota, this was not the case. So we subsidized the, the milk production. There was a guarantee price that was much higher than the world price. And that was too costly for the European Union, uh, so they had to take measures, and that was vol volume control, that was milk quotas. Now we produce on the world market, we produce for uh, world prices, that milk quota is not necessary anymore. What I do believe that seven years ago we, we knew that we could produce for the world market, but still we have already, for the last seven years, still that milk quota, and did not decide to gradually uh, um, abolish the milk quota. This is now a hard landing and not a soft landing. Are you worried for dairy farmers across Europe? How will the I, transition go? I'm a bit worried uh, for quite a lot of the smaller farmers, yes, because, uh, uh, and I also think that the risk is that the, the milk production is going from the mountain areas down to the best uh, land and, and, and uh, 
that uh, the countryside, the rural side in the mountain areas will, will um, uh, lose uh, the, the, the That's what farming. the French call the yeah. 1,000 cow farm, yeah. the yeah. so-called German model, these yeah. gigantic farms with more than 1,000 cows. There's the a same, green, you don't yeah. welcome that. We see the same shift in Sweden and uh, I think Finland also and quite a lot of countries. So, so that, that is a, uh, a problem if you talk about biodiversity and, and also the, the quality of, of that uh, landscape that the cow and the uh, and the cheap produces. So I, I think that would be a bad thing. Yeah. So the conclusion is that Europe needs common rules, well, but it's difficult Maybe not to find quotas, but, but uh, the shift is, uh, the, uh, of course, change uh, uh, is coming after but, the shift. But it's difficult to find mm. a, a one size fits all method, really, isn't it? Mm. Absolutely, like you've seen in, in, in that picture as well, that there was a Finnish farmer using a milking robot. Well, in some countries in the European Union, they still milk the cows by their hands. So mm. there's a lot of yeah. differences mm. in the European as well. And that can, cannot be solved by the cap. There's a lot of responsibility, responsibility for the member states themselves, sovereignty as well, subsidiarity, yeah, that um, the problems that you face maybe in Sweden or in Netherlands should be tackled by the Dutch government and not by Brussels. And what is the, the, the mood uh, among farmers? Are they still in favor of the cap? I can give you an example of one of the greening measures. Like was mentioned, 5% of your farmland you should take out of production for ecological focus area. Well, um, for example, in the Netherlands, we have very fertile uh, farmland that is producing maybe five times more per hectare than for, let's say, southern Portugal or Romania. It's quite immoral, maybe, or not responsible to say also to that farmer, you have to take out of production 5% of your fertile farmland. Um, I think farmers don't understand this and uh, I think it's very difficult for them that they don't have a choice how to fulfill greening. I think it would be better if they go for uh, organic production and more quality products because the consumers want that. Because the, the, uh, if, if you produce five times more, part of that is because it's uh, extremely conventional and much uh, uh, chemistry and fertilizers. Okay. Yeah. Well, Jan Huytema and uh, Peter Eriksson, thank you so much for taking part in this edition of Talking Europe. Thank you. Thank you for watching you. the program. I'll return in about 10 minutes after the news break on France 24. Goodbye.